And this is Vibrant Spaces, a show about placemaking, activating, and connecting city spaces to the communities you serve. Hey, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of the Vibrant Spaces podcast here at Story City. My name is Tim Souza, Head of Community Activation, and this is Emily Craven, our CEO and amazing case studies guru. Um, I am super excited about today's uh, episode as we are plugging, it's, we're talking about the importance of plugging uh, artists into urban planning and vibrance. Em, I, it's my happy space. Something? Hmm? It's my happy space. It's my happy space. I have so many case studies. You know you want a case study, don't you, Tim? Oh, I was just best to ask for one. So yeah, give us one. Yeah. What, what I, you just I, told me the other day? I love it. So I, I love it when cities plug in artists in different ways, right? Particularly because creatives have this amazing lens on the world that that really gets the regular citizen excited about things in the city. And so today's case study that I want to bring you is from Colorado Springs. So in Colorado Springs, the downtown association there, uh, which is the downtown ventures, they have a program that they run every year called Art Spot. And so Art Spot is essentially these 21 pot plants that they get artwork, sculptures, et cetera, into these 21 pot plants. And so rather than like regular public artwork commissioning, these artworks are only there for 12 months. So they are temporary pieces. The city is not purchasing them for long-term placement. And so every year they run a new expression, a new call out. And so those pieces get renewed every 12 months. And um, not only that, but each year, because they get renewed and it's this big event that the fact that there are new pieces every year, businesses will then sponsor specific pieces every year. And it then drives people to then walk through that downtown and they'll move where those flower pots are. So if there's like a whole bunch of new businesses that have opened in a new area of downtown, they'll like strategically move some of those pots to different areas to get people to drive into new and different areas. And they will sometimes if like a piece like really hits at the heart of the psyche of the the cultural psyche of the city they will actually permanently purchase pieces that then mm. they become part of the like city's art collection so they make themselves more nimble by not having to pay like full commissions because they're essentially renting pieces right those pieces then they get the buy-in from businesses or from like local families will sponsor one. Like it'll be, you know, someone in memory of a father will sponsor one. So they're kind of like park benches in a way, like living park benches. But they use them to draw vibrancy. They use them to do art walks. They use them to support their new businesses, to get people moving through that area. And because it's new every year, it gives an excuse for people to return as a habit into downtown to see what is new, right? Um, and I really love, like, the method that they use as well to do a lot of their just public art in general. Like, there was an alleyway in particular that they did, it like, an alleyway renewal um, that they, um, when they would put the call out to creators, they would just ask for a portfolio and like a short description of who they are as an artist and why they wanted to do this project. And then they would make a short list. And from that short list, they would give a stipend to the artist to be able to complete those applications um, for a full proposal for an art piece so that they made sure that diverse artists could actually put in proposals and all of that burden and the cost of putting a proposal together did not fall on the artists. And so they lost diversity as a result of someone having to choose whether or not they could do this proposal versus do another shift at their job. And so I love how they respect the labour of the creative community, but then they also understand that like new and adding new things and adding new layers and making something an expectation is something that builds habit and repeat visitation, and then making something movable, right? Like it, I, I love how they have plugged in local artists into that landscape, connected them with businesses to build vibrancy. And it's something that 
as we've talked about before, stays in between things, right? It's something that draws mm -hmm. people down consistently as a permanent semi, I should say semi-permanent little art flavor that they can move, which is really cool. Yeah, and correct. I, and it, yeah, it, that's, that's exactly right. And and then the additional benefit to artists as well is that someone in the community can choose to purchase those pieces at the end of that 12 months. So how big are these pots? Are they like big ones that trees can fit in kind of pots? So like, um, yeah, so like they're, they're pretty sizable. If you tried to hug one, you probably couldn't close your hands around them. But so they're, like, they're, they're movable, movable enough that you can lift them and if you had like three sturdy strong armed men, you could like lift them into a, <laughs> a truck. Wheelie kind of thing. Them. Correct, yeah. yeah. But not exactly easy to steal. No. <laughs> filled with a lot of dirt. A lot of these sculpt these like sculptures are like metal. They've got their little plaque. They're filled with flowers. It would be very difficult to to run away with them. To run away with them. Which is brilliant then. So I think transitioning into this week, last week we chatted about that's a hard transition. I'm so sorry. That was, that was as good as it's going to get. Um. No, you, can, you, can, you can be like, that makes sense. And I think that uh, that I really loved that about our conversation. With I, yeah. Right. I think that makes sense. And I think that really connects with what we talked about this week with Baltimore, because they're really like engaging those artists and helping them kind of put in the same similar installations. And last week, we really chatted about that like top down approach of a Melissa-tocracy. And if you haven't learned about Melissa-tocracy, go listen to last week's episode. But this week, we're really going to talk about how do you look at that connecting that grassroots community of artists into the city. And it's something that's a personal passion of mine, because I really think it's like a peacemaking approach, right? And it's about oh, how, are, yeah, how are you being community driven? How are you creating something as a, a collective? How are you not coming at things from a like, I think the, we'll talk about it more, but like the, what she does with the graffiti task force, when I say graffiti task force, you're probably thinking police and hunting down these people who are spraying things. And she's taken a vastly different approach that really elevates that community and puts a direct contact with her in the mayor's office. So without further ado, tell us about who this amazing woman is, who is transforming this space. Today, from the lovely city of Baltimore, we have the delightful Tonya Miller-Hall. She is the Senior Advisor for the Office of Arts and Culture. She is directly in the Mayor's office at Baltimore, and she's a, a pioneering figure in Baltimore's cultural landscape. So she's serving as the city's first Senior Advisor for Arts and Culture within the Mayor's office since the 1990s. So it's been a it's been a fair minute since they had this particular role. Tonya is a Baltimore native, but she ventured to New York City in her 20s where she crafted a frankly bonkers, crazy, illustrious career spanning fashion, music, social justice, like lifestyle branding. She's collaborated with notable figures such as, you know, um, like rockers like Steven Tyler, musicians like Wendy Williams, Missy Sixty Jeans, Enyus, WWD, like Teen Vogue. Uh, and she's orchestrated some pretty significant events like the National um, Equal Justice Awards, the New York AIDS Walk, GLAAD Media Awards, and, and MTV Music Awards. So Tonya's uh, professional journey has brought her back to Baltimore in 2018 uh, when she became the, the Senior Director for Public Affairs and she oversaw communications, social media, citywide events and, and festivals, public art curation, content creation, design, sponsorship development, and Charm TV's original networking programming. And so Tonya was the Chief Marketing and Programs Offer for the Baltimore Office of Promotion and Arts, leading brand revitalization and introducing a new new vision of the artscape and as the senior advisor for arts and culture at the mayor's office Tonya is fervently dedicated to really transforming Baltimore into this um, hub of innovation and creativity within the creative sector so she's reimagining projects such as Ask Artscape in 2023 so that's Baltimore's flagship arts festival. She successfully acquired a million dollars in grant funding Bloomberg Philanthropies Art Challenge for an innovative inviting light, light project. She's slated for 2024-2025 for as, as one of eight U.S. cities selected from 154 submissions. Like what an amazing get and and this project will transform their public spaces with these really innovative lighting installations all the while increasing public safety so like Tonya is this powerhouse and we are so excited to chat to her today so let's dive straight into the interview 
Let's go. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about today's interview. So are we. I'm excited about this conversation and all of the amazing things that you are doing in, in Baltimore and to dive deeper into what that placemaking vibrancy looks like and the efforts that you transform the conversation around arts in the community. Absolutely. We like to start all of these podcasts with a little bit of a getting to know you. We know from our previous conversations that you did not originally live in Baltimore. So when did you move to Baltimore? What has been the biggest change you have witnessed in the community from when you moved until now? So maybe we missed this. So I actually grew up in Baltimore, but moved mm-hmm. to New York when I was 21 and spent most of my adult life and built a career in New York for nearly 25 plus years. So in some ways, most of my adult experiences happened in New York City. And I returned to Baltimore now five years ago. So in 2018, I believe that's five years ago. Okay, so then let's ask a better question. What's the biggest difference from growing up in Baltimore versus the way that you've seen Baltimore over the last five years? Baltimore is a different place than it was when I was growing up, certainly. There's just more intention. I think the spaces, the city feels the same, but I think that there is a more robust creative community. Certainly when I was here, I felt like an outlier. I think the community felt more underground. So did those cool kids over there, like not sure what they're up to. So it wasn't a part of a mainstream existence where now there's artists and writers and literary writers and poets and sculptors and all sorts of folks hanging out in spaces together where I just felt like I was like the outlier in my space. So that's why I had my eyes on New York. Thought my tribe would be there. And what brought you back to that Baltimore vibe? Love. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, you have all of these experiences all over the world, and then you meet a guy that's from Baltimore, your hometown. So in some ways it was serendipitous. I was, I guess I was supposed to be back here. We dated for about six years, so it took me about six years to be convinced that I could find a space in Baltimore that, you know, sort of worked with my creative energy. So, And with that, what is like one of your favorite places in Baltimore? Do you have a place that's special to you specifically? Maybe when you can reflect on being a kid and then now that could be maybe two spaces, but what is, what is oh, it? Wow. Like? Yeah. To think about that. I, I think that, Baltimore is a very enchanting town. It's got great little pockets of neighborhoods. So I think the discovery of new neighborhoods that maybe weren't fully flushed out or developed or have transformed since I was a kid is really um, special. Like, I I find that really interesting. There's a space... And I believe it's like Hampton, it's kind of off the beaten path, but it's the underpass of the Jones Falls Expressway. And the river, the Jones Falls runs by there and then people can jog and ride their bikes and that sort of thing. And then there's like, of course, the graffiti artists have taken over a wall or two. So this is a very interesting sort of underground space. I Two years ago, I'd hoped to do a music festival there because it's really off the beaten path and I think it kind of lends itself to a cool event space so still got still have my eyes on it I love that that would be super fun okay so if you had a giant billboard anywhere in Baltimore it could be under a bridge if you wish (laughs) but if you had a a giant billboard anywhere in Baltimore that could say anything metaphorically speaking what would you want that message to be? What do you want to leave the the planet or the city uh, with as a message? I would say be bold, think big. (laughs) Honestly, I mean, those are words that I live by. So to be bold and to think big is really the ticket. I think that people will see that mentality and that vibe throughout this whole interview as we talk through some of the the wonderful things that you've been implementing in Baltimore over uh, the last 
year and a half. Um, so in some of our prior conversations, you mentioned that Baltimore doesn't have a, a cultural plan, even though it has become a much more cultural place than when you left and that you were wanting to build one out. And so I want to understand what happened in the city to create the environment that you see today and that you're trying to give more fuel to that fire. You touched a little bit of history when we last spoke. Maybe we can start there. So I will say, I, to your point, I've been in this world for about a year and a half, much to the Scots administration, thinking boldly, there had not been an arts and culture liaison person in the mayor's office, sitting in the mayor's office since the 90s. And Baltimore is a city of creatives. It's always been the city of creatives. But when you think about the number of cultural institutions that we have, we have some of the finest museums on planet Earth. We also have MICA, which is an art school, arts institution. We also have Peabody, which is a musical dedicated to music. And so you have all of these cultural spaces. And to not have someone sort of represent the arts at a cabinet level within an administration seemed out of sync. So I'm glad that the mayor was um, thoughtful enough to uh, create this role, but and also to have me in this role. So with that, then how do you really start to leverage the resources that I have available to me at the mayor's office and really come up with a cultural plan an ethos, things that people can lean into and understand why this city is a cultural destination and that we're a world-class city producing world-class talent, musicians, the BSO, the BMA, all of these institutions speak to that. And so I think a cultural plan would be the next best step for the city. What is your kind of vision for that cultural plan? Just high level, we can jump into some of these crazy examples that you've been talking about of, of the actions you have been taking, which I assume will conform that cultural plan. What is your elevator pitch of that cultural plan? Yeah, so I think I've never created a cultural plan before. So that part, um, I think I've been doing a lot of research, looking at other cities, seeing how they're putting together their cultural initiatives. I'm going, I do the mayor's office. I lead the mayor's office of arts and culture, a committee of 22 individuals. So leaning on them, they're from different practices and disciplines. So also tapping into that as a resource. But I think that once we start to come up with a sub group to really help me put a, a soft blueprint together, my plan is to go out to market and start to talk to the various cultural institutions. What would they like to see in this plan? How should they be represented in this plan? So that could vary from the culinary arts to the literary arts to higher cultural institutions that I named, the BSO or, the, or MICA, or any of those institutions. How should they show up in this plan as well? And so I think Baltimore is a metropolitan city. Sometimes it operates as a small town. And so if people don't have buy-in, there is there's hell to pay. <laughs> and so I definitely want to make sure that I'm thoughtful in that way. And people are wildly invested in this role and wildly in invested in the future of the role in the office. So I want to make good on those things. That's wonderful. And I, I think you even mentioned that even now you're starting to get individual artists and creators picking up the phone and calling you and giving you your opinion. So I imagine that would also take a huge part in planning. Yeah. Um, the things that I hear, you know, I get so much positive feedback. So sometimes it's a little overwhelming. I don't want to believe my own hype. Right. So, but folks are, you know, what people will say to me is we've never had this kind of access to the mayor and to the mayor's office. And so I try to make myself available. I try to be thoughtful in my responses. I, I'm not going to please everyone. I've stepped on a few landmines, but I'm always a 
a quick to, to try to make good on a conversation and just leaning into all everyone. I'm not here. I often say I don't have all the answers and going out to market and talking to those individuals who do have the answers. And sometimes people who are smarter than me to lean on them to help me come up with this plan is which is what's going to be key. I think the thing that I loved the most about the conversations that we had previously was that even without a cultural plan, you were doing some really amazing things in the city. And so you mentioned everything from a pocket park to a, a gas station to a graffiti task force. And so I really want to, in this episode in particular, dive deeper into these, I would term them guerrilla efforts that you're transforming each of these spaces you're not waiting for some strategic plan to fall down from on high you're actually doing stuff now as you're also doing the planning and you've gone out and you've garnered that community support and you're starting to garner that city support so I would really love I suppose to start off with the pocket park that you mentioned where you were able to build it in I believe you said six weeks can you please tell us that story Oh my goodness. I, I, if I back to Tim's earlier question, one of my favorite places is the Artscape Pocket Park. So the Pocket Park is uh, located on the corner, for those who are listening from other states, it's on Charles and 20th Street, bedded in the Arts and Entertainment District, which we call Station North. The Artscape Festival is an annual festival that's been activated for the last 40 years. Of course, it was down during the pandemic. So last year was the first year that we were bringing it back online. And I had the opportunity to lead those efforts as the producer and instantly thinking about the needs of the people, right? So often there's always, listen, I like to have fun more than anybody. I've been to more parties or events than most people, most humans. However, for a city this size and with the limited resources and with some of the challenges that we know about accessibility and some of the blight generations, decades of blights, vacant houses, how can we really use this festival to be transformational to communities and also have lasting impact? Right. Because once the good time is over, you're like, what's left? Like, that was great. But what's left? How did that really impact my life? And so did some walkthroughs and identified a vacant lot that was in pretty bad shape. Uh, the lot was partially owned by the city of Baltimore. So when you think about this vacant lot, it had individual row houses on the lots. Right. So it was three different parcels, but had been cleared many years before. So the city had a parcel and then another property owner had two parcels of the three. So it was easy for me, I use air quotes, easy for me to get usage of the city property, but then having to talk to the private property owner to convince him that this was the right thing to do because for him, it, the lot was just sitting there. He hadn't been successful in selling it. That said, it was overgrown, you know, weeds, trees, it had these weird pebbles that I found out that weren't environmentally sound. So we had to clear the lot of these stones first to even level the ground, et cetera, et cetera. But once I got all of the permits and I had an architectural firm do the rendering, so that was the blueprint that was the start and we made it really simple the architectural firm we looked at a couple of pocket park i mean not pocket parks but like these parklets that cities were popping up during the pandemic that were really like clean and simple but how do you use the environment you know like would frame things so that was it so we really made the park we had to lay down more like uh, sand what they call pea gravel. My husband does construction, so I leaned on him a lot to translate what the architects were saying to me because they speak a different language than I do. But we managed to clear the lot, remove the stones. And the cool thing was the lot 
also had a lots of trash, but it also had a bin with a bunch of trash in it. And next to the lot is a 300 plus 350 plus residential space, like resident, low income, senior citizens, veterans are there. And it struck me as I was surveying the space, there was no green space for these seniors, right? So a lot of times they were just sitting on the stoop out front, like on a stone, a concrete wall, or standing under a tree canopy, just to sort of take cover from the sun. So I was like, this is egregious, right? So this thing is right next, like adjacent, an adjacent wall. So we were able to put some seeding, some trees, some greenery. We did these mounds with trees and plant shrubbery because you wanted shrubbery that was sustainable. And instantly, it was an instant hit. It took about six weeks. They watched me carefully, the residents next door. They kept their eye on me, like, what is she up to? I think that the beautiful part of the story, the unexpected or the heartbeat of the story is that I didn't expect to fall in love with the residents. And they certainly were distrusting of who, what my mission was. And once we took the fence down, I was like, this is your park. This is for you guys. And they, it was really a beautiful moment because no one had actually ever come and sort of bought a gift <laughs> uh, of that magnitude. And then to think about, you know, often in these spaces, the developers aren't and aren't necessarily intentional in talking to residents. Um, so to see somebody peer to peer, almost representation matters. I should say I'm a black woman, the residents are mostly black. And so to see me show up in this way and with this park was really great. And instantly a few of the locals was like, I want to help maintain this park. We're going to take care of this park. And they have. And so I was able to carve out a maintenance budget from the, from my overall budget to not only pay for this one individual who is from the community to take care of the park, but I also pay for the association, the community association cleaning crew to take care of the park. And they like take care of the shrubbery and they water the plants and they've replanted since last year, some new trees. And so it really has become, every time I drive past there, there's 30, 30 people, 20 people just sort of hanging out in the park. So it's a really cool space. And then we also put up a mural on the wall that, that adjoins the park. So it really did make, I mean, that's what placemaking is all about and placekeeping, transforming space. But now we name it. We named it Artscape Park because the festival was 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 the means of getting it done. I think that's beautiful, and I feel like that's the kind of story that you want to hear coming from cities and the transformation that happens within that community. That is also, I think it's beautiful that you had such community buy-in, and I know that a huge part of that is the way you have conversations with people around those spaces. And I remember you talking to us about the conversation with the individual who's working in that community or to take care of it now and to be that point person for maintaining the park. So if I guess the question I would have for you is for other people in different cities or maybe even in adjacent communities who are listening, what what would be your recommendation for how they could build out this space? You kind of gave us a, hey, I did A, B, C, and D. What, how could we start? How did you start? How could you start on that? So back to my earlier point, I mean, I've always been a big thinker. And so how do you make, one, the festival in the three years that it was down, I felt like it was important to make a huge impact. But also if you're spending thousands of dollars it should make sense. I like nice things. I feel like everybody should have nice things. And But if we're spending that kind of money, how are we investing in communities? It's one thing to have a nice band or listen to you know music, but those are the questions people ask. No matter what you're doing, whatever the mayor may post on any given day, somebody will say, but what about the air conditionings in the schools? Like this totally unrelated, but people want, their lives to their livelihood to be improved no matter what. And so there's always going to be that. So if I think to the listeners, 
if you have a budget and you are activating whether it's a block party or some other kind of festival or small thing what are the small things you can do you can hire the artists or do a community day where you're painting tree boxes or those kind of things just to make some beautifications and some small improvements in your neighborhood it goes a long way for sure and i think something that i'm curious about is that for the property owner who held those other two lots what was your argument to them as to what why they should let this park exist that part so so funny people ask me this all the time so not only was the property owner of the vacant lot. It was the property owner across the road who had the gas station. I was like, can I do this mural project on this 10,000 square foot space? I am, I'd like to say my New York training has prepared me for this role. When you're in New York, you raise your hand for just about anything. You're in the room with the most ambitious people on planet Earth. People move there to be even more ambitious. And so I think, um, I'm just really good at pitching ideas. And I think it's just the way I show up. I try to talk with some integrity and talk with some authenticity and just show up as my honest self. Like, this is the right thing to do. And so I did, for the property owner who owns the vacant lot, I asked him if we could just do six month lease, like incrementally. So now it's been a year. So we've done two and we're coming up on the next six. And so not to get in the weeds too far, but the contract with his lots aren't with the city, it's with the community association. So I work closely with the community association in that district to one, get the approval to make sure the community actually, who's this woman putting it apart? But I to get buy-in with the community associations and different um, leaders. So I had letters of references and that sort of thing. So now they hold the lease for the park. I still continue to pay for the maintenance out of my original budget. And he might be on the hook for a park forever at this point. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> <laughs> I love that you structured it and got him into to this buy-in. And I love that you've also created an economic benefit for him too, right? To want to financially be, uh, to maintain yeah. this collaborative community space. Absolutely. And he doesn't pay for the cost of the maintenance before he had it continuously. He was either getting fined or something because of the trash and all of these things. So in some ways I, I did him a small favor. So we'll see how it goes. We're already here. And then the auto repair shop that's literally across the street is owned by a gentleman called Mr. Kim who had owned the gas station was previously a gas a service station for 20 years. And then transformed it into an auto repair shop. So the actual gas tanks are removed, but it still looks like an, a service station with a garage and the overhang of where the gas tanks were. And it has an adjacent wall. And so that was about a 10,000 square foot project. And I showed him some images of other gas stations that had been reimagined in Miami and various places. And I say, Hey, would you be interested in doing this? And he was like, absolutely. With little to no convincing, I came in hot too. I thought I was going to be like, I was going to have to like, you know, come up with a big song and dance. And he was pretty agile in his thought. He just wanted to see what it was going to look like at the end. So we did renderings of the actual color palette and introduced him to the artist. And this is important because the space, so this district station north is a really mixed demographic. While it's an arts and entertainment district, it also has a heavy LGBTQ community residents. And it used to be touted to be like a career town Asian community at some point, somewhere in the 90s, it was touted to be like little Korea town, but it never popped off. But there are Korean or, or 
different Asian descents that have property ownership there. So you just get this mixed bag of different communities in a way you have to communicate with said folk. Uh, Mr. Kim is Asian, but he's a lovely man. And he was fascinated because I don't think many people had really come to talk to him and include him in these kind of conversations. And so he was like, oh, I'm so happy to come to work every day. And he just brought me so much joy to make him happy. And during the festival, the opening night of the festival, we hosted a party that we walled off. We had bike racks walled off. We bought in palm trees and a DJ and a bar and we had hors d'oeuvres. So we had a party there and also in the park, the first lady, the governor's wife attended. And at first, Mr. Kim wasn't going to come. And I had to convince him and his wife to both come. And oh my gosh, the photos are just beautiful and just very excited. He was just, he just was blown away. And that's the part that I was not, I'm just a workhorse. So that that's the part that you're not prepared for in your job is like the, the, the generosity or the spirit that you feel from communities from doing this work. So I think that's one of the things that I, I have to compliment you on and, and both of the conversations that we've had so far is you do a really great job of activating and bringing people together and collaborating. And I think Thank that you. one of the the biggest pieces that I have you know learned from you and the coolest projects that you I think you've tackled, you've touched on a couple points and that's the bringing in the artists, bringing in these different community spaces, throwing in, throwing barbecue kind of events. But I really would love to talk about that graffiti task force you've been building because I think it's, it's a crown jewel in all of our conversations, at least thus far. And so in the first year and a half, you've built this task force. Can you tell us about this task force that you have launched and a little bit of like how you are utilizing this now community and bench of artists to do all these other projects? Yeah. To, just to piggyback before I go into that is really around seeing people and meeting people where they are is really the secret sauce in all of this. I think that Baltimore is a different, it's not New York, but I think to very say growing up in New York, but basically in my twenties and thirties, growing up in New York, you're forced to have conversations because it's such an, an immigrant city. It's so many dialects and so many communities. And so you're having these conversations with people from all walks of life. And so I think that's also a really great training and superpower for me because I'm not that people are afraid, but most people won't talk to people that they don't understand or don't know or haven't been in touch like, or haven't seen before. So they're like the guy over there or whatever. I mean, we talk, hear stories. People don't even talk to their own neighbors, right? So the graffiti task force also is sort of like on the margin, right? So we have a huge graffiti issue in the city. I've talked to other cities. It, it seems it's not just a Baltimore problem. The, the pandemic years when no one was on the street really left these spaces open for graffiti artists and not all graffiti is the same. I think there are vandals who just throw up words and not necessarily have an artistic expression in them. And then there are true street artists and graffiti workers. So we have a few artists or taggers who their work is just everywhere along the highway, on top of buildings, on trash cans, on people's walls. And so I was like, we've got to do something about this. So I had been successful in bringing in some of the most, some of the premier graffiti street artists in the city. There's what they call the OGs that's been around since the nineties. <laughs> and I'd hired a, one or two of them last year to work on different projects during Artscape weekend. So I tapped into them and they said that they would join this task force. And this is not really around penalizing people or putting people in jail. It really is. Can we come up with some real solutions to mitigate the city of unwanted and vandalism, mm -hmm. vandalized work? And so it's a task force comprised of a few artists, a muralist, some 
graffiti artists, there's portrait artists in there, and then some city service workers. So the DOT team, the Department of Transportation, because oftentimes they're charged with cleaning up graffiti, mitigating graffiti work. And then the Department of Public Works also has like a graffiti team that goes out and clears the work. And so now the current system is if you call 311 and you're like, can you come, somebody's tagged my wall, they would deploy one of the city agencies to go and cover the work. Sometimes it's done in the same paint color. Sometimes it's just white. It's almost like white out. And so then you have like white out patches everywhere along the expressway and on buildings. And I'm like, well, that's not attractive either. So I'm working on some rules of engagement. Could we potentially build a team of artists that we deploy once city agencies knows that there's a target wall, they're going to go white it out. And then we deploy said graffiti artists or street artists that we have now as a consultant on our roster to go out and put up sanctioned work. So we're creating sanctioned spaces for work. Say, say. Yeah. And and I was saying, and you've really built relationships with these artists already. Can you talk a little bit about your art after dark program and how, and how that has really transformed the way that community is seeing street art, graffiti art, and what it means to have color up on the walls and in the community. Right. So the, their recommendation, the two main artists, street artists was like, we need to put up better work. If we put up more work, it will be less likely to get tagged. So we did our first installment of an, of an event called Art After Dark. It was about three weeks ago now. I identified also off the beaten path space called Lexington Street, which used to be a huge retail corridor that's since been shut down. It hasn't been active in about 10 years. So all of the people listening, the storefront gates that are on these retail shops, That's what we reimagined and repainted. So initially, how this was all going to play out, how we're muralists, portrait artists, and street artists, and graffiti taggers all going to play in the same sandbox. Because, of course, there's politics and everything, right? So I'm like, how are they all going to play? How did you get that to happen? Right, and so... I'm such a, I mean, I'm not even a nerd, but I felt like a nerd in this space. I was like, should we have an Excel spreadsheet? Should I put numbers in front of each retail spot? Should we assign? Should we make an assignment? I'm like totally trying to nerd this out. And they just came up. They just kind of rolled in with their cans and their backpacks. And every, they just sorted it out amongst themselves. That's the beautiful part of it is that what I did was organize closing the streets, making sure there was like, so the program was from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Sort of trying to capture this nighttime, which is where most graffiti artists start to play, but they're actually out at two o'clock in the morning. But I wasn't doing that. <laughs> but I was like, this is the best I can do with the resources that I have. We're going to pretend it's two o'clock in the morning. And so we had a DJ in a bar. We had light projections on the adjacent wall. So that it was live stream. So as the artist was working, their work was projected on an adjacent wall by this light um, projection artist. And so it was really beautiful. And we're going to do another installment of Art After Dark because I think as we start to build this community and this muscle, we will start to suss out the bad actors in the space because they kind of police themselves too. And people had crazy FOMO. People were like, I can't believe I missed that. But it was a moment because... The artists that we signed up, we signed up about 15 artists. We knew that they were coming, but in the end, it was about 25 artists or it could have been more because then a gang of like street artists showed up based on a call and then everybody had their, and we had more than enough wall space. So that's why I thought it was really beautiful because it was organic and they were willing to take a chance. In some ways, I represent the man because I work for the city. (laughs) I'm that person. 
but I'm not a bureaucrat. So I think I also have that going for me. I show up as a creative. And so I'm not the guy in the suit or, you know, the gal and pinstripes or whatever. And so they're like, oh yeah, this is cool. We can do this. And it was really cool. And we had big bright lights that DOT gave us and it was fantastic. Now I will tell you that the formula is there are graffiti artists and street artists that work never gets tagged. And so on that block, I think it was maybe 30 different gates that we touched since then. Only two of the mural pieces have been tagged. Pieces that look like murals as opposed to pieces that look like street art. And so that's the learning curve. And that's what the street artists have been saying. Like there is, if it looks like legitimate work, they're not going to tag it. But if it looks like daisies and sunshines, maybe they don't have respect for it and they'll tag it that's listen that's not my code that's just how they're interfacing with each other so i'm excited about it because people have reached out and when is the next art after dark and so i'm right in the process now of identifying a few spaces and then working on these sanctioned mural projects or art projects that we can deploy once our agency team goes out and white walls white wall it and then we can deploy said artists to go and put up sanctioned work and come up with a very cool logo so that other agencies will understand that this is sanctioned by the city and this should be here and it's not just crapola. <laughs> Uh, and so to get into, as you said before, the, the kind of get into the weeds there, because I know that the people listening are going to be like, okay, how can I take this and do this in my own town? So if, so the 15 artists that you had, I'm assuming that you paid those 15, but the ones that came up just came up and, and did it for the love of it. I think that's very important. Yes. To have combo, right? Yes. We paid the artists, definitely negotiated fees in advance. Some of the artists, there's one premier artist, I'm I don't know how he feels if I sort of just blow up his name across the world. But so one of the artists who really served as a consultant to help us tap into some of the street artists, he, we paid him and he parsed out additional fees to his crew that came in. And it was just really interesting because some of them wanted to be seen. Some of them didn't want to be seen. Some of them took photos, some of them didn't. But the guys who just, like, they were guys who, oh my goodness, I saw this on Instagram, like, live feed, and I just came down. I live around the corner. I got my cans. I'm going to just go to it. And that was really cool. That was very cool. But it's very important to pay artists. And with the, the areas that you're looking to identify, from memory, this particular avenue you were able to get that permission because a lot of those buildings were owned by the city. Are you looking for other additional areas where that is the same thing? What's your criteria for the new areas you're looking at for other after, uh, after uh, Um, Some of the spaces will be owned by the city and some of the spaces I'll have to do my dog and pony show and ask the owner if they would be interested in participating in this. So there's another retail corridor called Greenmount Avenue. It doesn't have a large stretch as the Lexington Street corridor did, but there's one particular property owner who owns a dry cleaners and he's been tagged. His gate constantly gets tagged. So one of the city council members was like, oh, you guys should come to Greenmount and do that row. So it's just be a matter of getting permission and working out some agreement and to get that done. I don't know a world where people would be like, oh, no, I don't want to do anything cool or put any art on my wall. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm sure there's one person on the universe that's, that's like, no, no, no. Because the other thing is just the maintenance of it. And it's also the heartbreak of it, right? Because as soon as we finished Mr. Kim's, we did Mr. Kim's service lot. And maybe two weeks later, it was tagged. Awful. Just horribly. He was heartbroken. And so we went back out. We redid it, cleaned it back up. And then we put the 
graffiti seal it over it, which you can power wash off. So we had to do that twice because over the winter it got hit again and with like black, really deep black paint pigments that bled through. So it's a struggle. And the graffiti sealant is really, really expensive. It's like a hundred dollars a gallon. So it's an investment. So I can understand why someone, you know, they go home feeling great and then they come back the next morning and somebody's tagged it. That's really that emotionally it's not cool. Yeah. And I think that it's also a culture shift as well, right? Is because because it's happened for so long. You are starting the the movement of that and it will take a while for it to set in and for that respect to set in and and as you say you learn who does get tagged and who doesn't get tagged and you use more of their work right i'm curious as to what did this cost you versus a like traditional art installation and i'm interested also in that conversation around you said that you're doing a lot with a smaller budget so i'm interested in how did you fund each of these activations that we've been talking about so for the larger projects that I did last year during Artscape, I received a grant from the state because the, obviously there was huge investment to bring Artscape back as a festival because it had been down for three years. So I was able to garner the support of a senator and he helped me advocate and get a grant to bring the festival at large back music, soundstage, all of these bits. But this was also for Artscape. Uh, we had four stages and national and local talent, but also we installed about eight to nine mural projects and we wrapped electrical boxes. So we did a lot of sustainable art-based projects for the festival. And so the Art After Dark project was a scrappy budget. I worked in concert with a capital grant. So uh, there's another sort of like a neighborhood association that sort of takes care of the district and they had some capital improvement money. So this was considered a capital improvement because rusty gates versus beautiful glow, shiny gates. So we were able to get the paint. I worked with another woman who's an artist, really was a facilitator of this sort of capital side. And then we had a small budget, less than 10 K from the city for the light projection and the DJ and all the other cool things. And then paying the artists too. It sounds like everyone wants the, the to have nice things, like you were saying earlier, right? And so it sounds like you were able to kind of tap the shoulders of everybody who is invested in making sure that the community has has nice things. Yeah, I think that to Emily's point, it is a cultural shift. It's community engagement and this urban revitalization using artists to do the work, right? And we know how artists can transform spaces quickly. Any community in New York will tell you that, you know, Soho was built on the backs of artists. Unfortunately, then said artists get priced out. Gentrification, unfortunately, arises and then you get priced out. So that's not the intention here. Certainly, we want to be more mindful as we start to think about how do we get artists at the table to have some of these conversations about their needs in the city and around housing, about artist studios, all of these things. But I think that they're just excited to have access to the mayor's office and to also be invited to the party. That's beautiful. I cannot thank you enough, Tonya, for chatting with us today. It has been a phenomenal conversation and a huge pleasure to have you here with us today. I wanted to have one final personal question uh, to close out with maybe a drop of wisdom. Uh, And that is what are bad recommendations that you hear in your profession um, or area of expertise that you believe people should be ignoring? I I don't have a, a keen example, but I will tell you that what people have said to me in most of my careers, various jobs, 
is I think that my passion terrifies them. And so sometimes people ask me to slow down and literally can we just take a beat for a minute? And so I would say if there is someone out here listening who is a uh, bold thinker and passionate about their work, just keep pushing. You'll find, you'll eventually find the gig where people appreciate all of those assets and you'll just be able to just do the work. Beautiful. I love that, Tonya. Thank you so much for joining us today. It has been an absolute delight and a pleasure. Thank you guys very much. It was so much fun talking to you both. It's great to have you. Absolutely. Man, I loved that so much. Like innovative ways of shaking things up when you have little wiggle room, little funding, like inspirational. This is why I want to do on this podcast. So many inspirational people, Tim. Yeah, that's true. It is very true. And I think that what, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Tanya mm-hmm. and all of that she's doing from especially that grassroots perspective. But you know what I'm going to say. I do. I, I, I know exactly what you're going to say. I know exactly, exactly what you're going to say. Go and say it. Okay. Well, she's an outside voice. She was in New York. Like, she's coming to Baltimore and bringing her learnings with her, you know, using city and access to the mayor as like a systemic shift. She's, she learns that throughout her diverse experiences in New York City. Yes. But I feel like this is where yours and my viewpoints come together. She is a Baltimore native. Yes, she was in New York for like a while. But she's local. She's really outside perspective. She's our perfect meeting point. If your opinions and my opinions came together as a person, that person is Tanya. Perfect. You know what? I'll take it. That's beautiful because Tanya is freaking amazing. And I think that sometimes it is that going away, seeing new things and bringing them back to your home community that helps you be effective. So touche. Touche. But I think her novel ways of partnership is something really interesting and something we should talk about all she's like coming from instead of a what do we lack lens she's coming from like where do we have value and where are there assets that we can leverage lens and yeah 10 10 billion how many like how many birds can we hit with one stone can we hit 10 billion birds with one stone is this possible yes it is and i think that for me the thing that i find absolutely beautiful is where most people saw a underground rogue community she saw an underground asset that she wanted to be able to elevate. And I think that from a, like a peacemaking lens, it's, we have all of these movements right now, all of this social strife, especially when it comes to the conversation around police. And so instead of like stretching that department's funding even more, she said, Hey, we now have an, we, we have this challenge in the city where graffiti is going up. We have this challenge where we have to paint over these things. We, it's not beautiful. It's not fun. How do we fix all of it? Well, instead of continuing to do the thing that they've always done and taxing all of these other departments, she's created a solution that, as we've been talking about, that gives kind of money back to the taxpayers in a way by elevating a comedian and saying, hey, how about we use your artistic abilities to make this space beautiful and leverage the way that your community is already working for the benefit of everyone? And I think that that is just... It's something we need more of. And, look, and it's not to say that that's perfect, right? right? Like she, she didn't mention that like in the art, like the 25 murals, for like art after dark, like the, pay, the pieces for art after dark. She didn't mention that two of the murals who were not graffiti artists, they were muralists, got tagged. Like it's not perfect. Like Mr. Mr. Kim's got tagged and they had to repaint it and put like a protective coat over it. But like. You're doing the thing and you're testing it, right? And two out of 25 getting tagged. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it's, it's and it speaks to the value of what she's built because, I mean, and it, I think it goes back to the fact that they hired what, 10 to 15 of those people, 25 shows out. Yeah. 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 And so it's kind of this, this concept of the value of true community and tapping into those communities. So. I think it'll perfect. take a little while to build a culture of respect, though, around those initiatives, too. Like, Great. obviously, the way that she's starting to do that is by taking artists that are 
someone who's tagging respect and using them as the primary people for that. Right. Yeah, That's well, what shifting that culture. Yeah. I think looking at our little park at as well is really interesting because she, like the community obviously was super excited about it to the point where they're helping maintain it now. And so again, it's like reaching across and saying, Hey, this is our city, not my city. It's not the city's city. You are members in this community that I happen to hold the leadership role in. Let's build that bridge and give you direct access to the mayor's office, something that you may not have had that access to before. Yeah, it's taking, as you said, something that's an expense and is making it desired, it's building a system around slowly permeating the culture and communities. Yeah. And with that, it's she's building out this cultural plan. She pointed it out, right? She's in the process of saying, how do we systematize this? This as she experiments, right? Because it's not perfect. Things are still being spray painted. I'm sure things are breaking. There has to be a little bit, but she's iterating and creating a solution. And then a, an, out of that is coming, becoming a cultural plan for the city. And not every city has one. And so it's really beautiful to see how she's utilizing her role to uplift and create a system yeah. to support. The, right. It's the iteration that's important here, right? Is that not being afraid to do something just because you're afraid it might, like it might get tagged, right? Like. Do it. And if it does, what didn't get tagged, learn from it. Iterate. Do it. Iterate. Do it. Iterate. Right? Invite different parts of the community in to do different things. So who's the next one after the graffiti community that we, we bring in to make changes? Is it music? Is it what? Like, what is it still? What is it? You're starting with graffiti, but you're starting to invite others. Like they did in Soul Walk. Like they started with the African-American history. Um, but now, like the Latino um, history and, and 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 interest is is coming into the into that conversation, and different groups are wanting to also them. wanting to join that initiative, right? And it will be the same here: is that you iterate, you'll come back, you'll do another art after dark somewhere else where you'll iterate and you'll come back, and and you'll build ways that you inspire people like taggers to develop a craft rather than to, for it to just be an act of rebellion. That it can be an act of rebellion and it can be beautiful. And if that's the thing that they take away from it, then you've won a battle. A, a major battle. What I think too, that it's get paid for this craft that you're developing. Look at the, this form of art as value and, and then get good at it and get to the point where no one else will tag your shit. Mm. Right? You and even providing it. areas where like legitimately you're inviting people to come in and tag the graffiti alley like they set up in Melbourne, right? They had these alleys in Melbourne where, where you are like legally, they're like anyone can come in with a spray can and add to the walls there. And so you're seeing those start to get up in places. And I think even Tonya expressed that she wanted to add my voice into Baltimore as well. It's, it's culture shifting uh, again, slowly, but it doesn't mean it's not worth while. Wow. Right. Well, and I think it's important that looking at this piece of Baltimore is there's only one piece of Baltimore and one piece of what this cl collaborative model in the city is flushing itself out to be. We're missing the conjoining half of that system of all of those pairs coming together in the city and how they structure that working together and measuring of their success. Like Tanya's here experimenting. She really has a little lab going on, right? And Specifically, we focused on what she's doing to activate that grassroots arc. And I think the really cool piece about Baltimore is that it does have this larger rules net that's kind of really reflected as a case study in what Tanya is doing. Yeah, 100%. And that's why I'm excited, excited again for our next episode. We are staying in Baltimore again for our next episode. Because as Tim said, this is only one piece of the puzzle in Baltimore. The, there is insane collaboration that is happening within this community and how they structure that and how they work together. Recently, the Mayor Scott's administration in this collaborative work released their downtown rise strategy, which is a, a downtown strategy that is very um, implementation focused over the next 18 to 24 months of like, how can they turn things around quickly with the assets that they have? And it was an absolutely amazing conversation that I'm really excited for you guys to hear with some, again, very people who have had some 
crazy awesome careers that I'm very jealous of. So that's all coming up next week. So you should definitely tune in again. With that, we're not going to do any more spoilers. You've got to come back next week. And we were happy to have you here at the Vibrant Spaces podcast. Thank you for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful adventure this week. The Vibrant Spaces podcast is produced by Story City. You can find our entire archive on any podcasting app and on about.storycity.app, where we publish transcripts and show notes. This episode was produced by Tim Souza, and our staff includes Justin Kahn, Brett Ludwig, and Victoria Omitska. Our theme song is Happy Indie by Alex Guz. Our co-hosts are Tim Souza and me, Emily Craven. As always, thank you for listening. We hope you have a glorious adventure this week.